I am so excited today because we're going to be talking about feelings. And I promise you, I won't start singing about feelings because uh, everybody's sick of me singing about feelings today. Um, but we're going to be talking about the emotional themes by type. So I want to make sure, obviously, hopefully all of you know what human design is and you have your chart with you. Uh, you, you will need to know your type for today's presentation. Also, just want to say in, in the most loving and gentle way possible, sometimes when we learn human design, and I've been teaching human design now for almost 24 years, sometimes when we learn human design, we really love the complicated parts, right? We want to know what is this gate and what is this arrow and what does this mean? And we, we think that somehow the answers are in the little secret parts of the chart. And there's obviously good answers there. There are important answers there. But I will tell you after doing this for as long as I have, the bulk of the answers in your chart lie in the basic understanding of type, strategy, and authority. In fact, Ra used to teach that if you only followed type, strategy, and authority, and you didn't know anything else about your chart, you would sort of accidentally on purpose Start deconditioning yourself. Start gaining more awareness of what type I am. If you do not know your human design chart, Teresa is going to post for you in chat really quickly, a place where you can go run your chart right now. I'll say it out loud and you guys can go look. It's freehumandesignchart.com. And if you have your chart and you don't know what type you are, look for the, one of the following five words manifester or initiator, alchemist or generator, time bender or manifesting generator, orchestrator or projector, or calibrator or reflector. So if you see any of those 10 words on there, that's your type. I'll break down the difference between those pieces there too. So, all right. So without further ado, let's get started in, share, in uh, going through our presentation for today. My name is Karen Curry Parker. I am a multiple best-selling author, mostly of human design books and the co-founder of Grace Point Publishing. I have been an emotional freedom techniques practitioner since 2000, which is a long time ago. I've been a life coach since 1999. I was actually one of the very first trained life coaches in the world. I am an original student and actually worked for Ra Uruhu for several years uh, in the early 2000s, uh, starting in 1999. I have been teaching human design since 1999. I'm a quantum university PhD candidate. I actually just turned in my dissertation two weeks ago. Um, and I am oftentimes a guest lecturer at quantum university. I'm a TEDx presenter and I am the host of the quantum revolution podcast. Uh, I want to talk to you today about feelings. That is our, here's, we're going to do a broad overview on some of the challenges that we have when we talk about emotions. So oftentimes when we talk about emotions, the way in which we talk about emotions needs some shifting. So we're gonna explore a little bit about how do we need to shift the way in which we talk about emotions so that we can better understand the power of emotional frequencies. Because in the way in which we talk about feelings, we get confused and we're not actually optimizing the power of our emotional creativity, and how we can best use emotional energy as key indicators for where we are in our creative process. We're then going to talk about the difference between emotional themes and feelings and how that is reflected in your chart. And we're going to talk about interpreting the emotional themes for your chart, for your type. And I'm going to share with you that even if you've heard some of this before, or maybe you are, you've heard about your type and your emotional theme uh, in different ways. I'm going to give you a very different perspective today on how to use an interpretation of the emotional theme as an important way for you to really dial into where are you at? Where are you at in your life? Where are you at in your creative process? What do you perhaps need to shift and change in order for you to live more closely aligned with the person you were born to be? So let's start first with our vocabulary problem that we have with feelings. Oftentimes when we talk about feelings, we say things like, I am mad. I remember very distinctly teaching my kids to talk about their feelings with I am statements. I am mad. I am sad. I am happy. I am angry. I am disappointed. 
when we talk about feelings through the phrase I am, we're actually taking in those emotions and codifying them as part of our identity. We are solidifying them, we're incorporating them into our narrative. And as you'll see in just a minute, what we declare ourselves to be or who we declare ourselves to be oftentimes influences what we end up attracting into our life. So when we talk about our feelings as part of our identity, I'll show you in the chart in just a second why that doesn't work, why that's actually an incorrect way to talk about your emotional frequencies. And that's really what emotions are. They're emotional frequencies. The source of most emotional energy, the emotional energy that we use for creativity, comes from the emotional solar plexus. That's the center that we use for creating, and it's a center that teaches us when the timing is right for us to take action. The voice of that emotional solar plexus is, I feel. When we start to identify with our feelings, when we start to say, I am my feelings, we lock them into place. We actually cut ourselves off oftentimes from the body's way of communicating to us what we need to do next and when we need to do it. Not only that, we get stuck because vibrational vibrations move, emotional energies move when we identify with them and we incorporate them into our personal narrative, we lock them into place. And then we get stuck in emotional frequencies that can't move anymore. And it starts to limit our capacity to create. So the I feel voice comes from the emotional solar plexus. So in, in quantum human design, we call this the creative center. The purpose of this center ultimately in its highest expression is to use emotional frequencies to calibrate the heart center. And we calibrate the heart center into a state of coherence, meaning we calibrate the heart center into a highly creative state where it's wildly attractive and it programs us to see opportunities that are expansive and evolutionary. Or if the feelings that we're generating are not productive, if they're, they're we'll call them negative, I hate to call them negative, but if they're, they're not creative feelings, they're also creative too, but if they're not feelings that are generating frequencies towards what it is we're wanting to have in our life, we can program the heart into a state of non-coherence. So when we misuse the phrase, I am versus I feel, we actually start to limit our capacity to create. So for example, if I say to you, I'm feeling sad, that statement of I am comes from the G center. I am is part of the narrative, the story we tell about who we are. If I say I am sad, if I say I am my identity, if I am sad, I'm literally locking that energy into place as part of a story. And that locking that emotion into place starts to program this electromagnetic resonance field, the geomagnetic attraction force that is part of your heart. It starts to lock, program that attraction field into place. And then what you begin to pull into your life or what you just start to pull into your reality matches that part of your identity. I am sad. And now I'm calling in and noticing and paying attention to all these opportunities and experiences and relationships and circumstances that align with my identity as sad. If we want to use the creative center in the way in which it was intended, we have to start first by just shifting our vocabulary slightly. And I want to encourage you as we start this program to really start paying attention to how are you talking about your feelings? Are you using them as part of your identity? Or are you generating them as part of an emotional frequency of energy? Again, quick review here. The role of the emotional solar plexus is to synchronize the electromagnetic resonance field in the heart, or the aware, as it's, which is an awareness center, to, to really use those emotional frequencies deliberately and consciously, even if you're emotionally defined, to call in what it is you seek to create. If we look at that calibration center where the law of attraction lives, we see that in the heart, in the G center, there is an electromagnetic resonance field called the magnetic monopole that resides somewhere around the gate two. The gate two is all about allowing, receiving, expansion, support. We only allow 
to the degree to which the story we tell about who we are, our narrative, we only allow to the degree to which our story allows. So if we don't think we're worthy, we don't think we're lovable, if we don't feel powerful in our lives, if we don't feel like it's safe to be authentic for who we are, if we don't define for ourselves the narrative of who we are from a high empowered place, if we don't remember that we're here to serve a purpose bigger than ourselves, if we don't live from a place where we love our body and feel really embodied in our form, if we're not expressing compassionately, all of those qualities, that these qualities come from the gates of the G-Center, all of those qualities will influence what we're willing to allow, what we're willing to call in, what we're willing to allow ourselves to create. Emotional frequencies, the emotional energy you generate, is filtered through your sense of self-worth and your sense of lovability. And the combination of those factors influences what you actually manifest in your life. So it looks kind of like this in the human design chart. You may have heard the story, your thoughts create your reality. Well, your thoughts, your ideas, your stories, your imaginings, your dreams, your contemplations, your belief systems, those all take place in the head and the ajna. Those thoughts which create your reality trigger emotional frequencies in response to the thoughts. Literally, when you have a thought, your brain produces a photon storm. That photon storm causes the body to produce neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters, in turn, stimulate emotional frequencies of energy. Those emotional frequencies of energy then calibrate and filtered through our sense of self-worth and self uh, our sense of self-worth and our sense of lovability, they calibrate what we create and attract into our lives. Emotional energy is creative. The better thoughts we have, the more we consciously sustain a baseline frequency, which I'll show you in just a minute, of emotional well-being, the more we program the heart to call in and receive and allow all the goodness that we deserve that's in alignment with the truth of who we are. So are the emotional themes for type Anger, bitterness, disappointment, frustration. Are those themes actually feelings? No, they're not. The emotional themes for your type are signals. They're signals, they're a message from your energetic body that help you discern what's actually going on in your energy field, what's actually happening in your life. And they help you assess what you need so that you can keep telling a story that's better in alignment with the truth of who you are. So in this next little section, I wanna go through the emotional themes for each type. And I wanna invite you as we go through this conversation about each of these types to think about your emotional theme for your type. I want you to think about what is that emotional theme signaling to you? What is it telling you? I want you to think about, is that emotional theme, is that giving you some kind of a, a insight or, or information that is going to support you in potentially transforming and changing your current circumstance so that you can better be in alignment with what you deserve, the truth of who you are, authentic self-expression, compassion, self-love, self-worth. So take a second, take a deep breath with me. Find your chart, find the type on your chart, and let's go through and let's look at the types and let's revisit the emotional themes. And I want to invite you into exploring what is your emotional theme in your life sharing with you. Now, when I teach emotional themes, I teach emotional themes a little bit differently. I talk about an emotional theme happening, not just from within you. So you might have these feelings, you might feel these feelings. They're not really feelings, these signals, right? Or you can sometimes experience these feelings, these emotional themes in the world around you. So for example, when we talk about the emotional theme of the alchemist or the generator type, not only do you have the potential to feel frustration, you might also experience frustration pointed at you, people being frustrated with you from the world around you. So the emotional theme is not just something that comes from within you. It's in the soup, right? It's in the environment of your life. And it's something that comes up either internally or externally as, a, as an ongoing theme in your life. 
The second thing that I want to just bring to our awareness when we talk about emotional themes, I think sometimes because we want to talk about formulas and we want to, there to be a formula that if we just follow this formula, then um, everything will be okay. And oftentimes when we talk about emotional themes, we think, oh, if I just follow type strategy authority, the formula, then I'll never experience this emotional theme again. <clears throat> Not true. Your emotional theme is going to be part of the important signal that's going, that's in a feedback loop with your inner and outer environment all the time. You might have cycles where you don't experience a lot and that's good, but that means you're on track. But there's not going to be anything that you can do to get rid of that emotional theme. So make peace with it, make friends with it, because it is a really beautiful thing that's coming from within you that's kind of your compass. I also want to encourage us or just say that as we go through this, I wish we had, at least in English, different words for the emotional themes for type, because I really do think that they don't adequately really describe what's going on. So I'm going to use the words that they've been assigned. But I'd like for us to explore the possibility of rethinking these as not being emotions, but as much as they are signals and signals that signify how in alignment our energy is or isn't. And to stop thinking about it as being a feeling because it's really not a feeling, it's a signal. So let's start first with our initiator type. Initiators, which is the quantum human design word for a manifester, initiators have an internal nonverbal creative flow. In the shadow of this energy, if you are a manifester, you've probably been pushing through your whole life trying to make things happen and trying to manifest in the world, oftentimes using your force or your will. That manifesting oftentimes comes because over time in your conditioning, you learn to disconnect from that internal nonverbal creative flow or you learn to go underground with it. Maybe you learned that if you're gonna create something, you have to be sort of secretive or do it over here on the side because that's the only way to avoid having people intersect with that nonverbal creative flow and needing you or demanding of you that you explain what you're doing or asking you with all the best of intentions, do you need any help? And suddenly you have to stop following that internal nonverbal creative flow and put language to it. And when we put language to it, it makes it difficult for us to catch it again. We can't get back in that flow. And oftentimes we can't finish whatever it is that we are starting because now we've had to stop and use our energy to explain it. And so sometimes it becomes easier, just go do it quietly over here, right? And not tell people what you're doing or go underground with it. Sometimes we also see with initiators that when they, as children follow that internal nonverbal creative flow because they're not trained to inform and tell their parents, this is what I'm doing, or they don't feel safe sharing with their parents what they're doing. And oftentimes parents of initiators or parents of manifestors oftentimes really power on, overpower a manifestor children. And that can sometimes be uh, you know, very traumatic for manifestor kids. And so again, we learn to either shut off that connection to the flow or we go underground and get quiet with it, right? We don't let people know what we're doing. That direct inner nonverbal connection is a connection to source energy. I call it a connection to the quantum pulse. If you are an initiator, you are directly plugged in to the creative capacity of the world and as such, as a translator of the next new iteration of source, the next new manifestation of the next new possibility of the human story, you are here to be impactful. But the way in which you're here to be impactful can be different than how sometimes we're trained in, in traditional human design. You're not here to be impactful by initiating others. That's not your job. Your job is not to go, okay, now who needs to be initiated by what I'm about to do? You're here to initiate people energetically. You're modeling, you're embodying that full, deeply connected inner play, that co-creative alignment with you and that internal nonverbal creative flow, and then marrying that with informing the people who need to be informed so that they can move out of the way, not because you, you need permission, because you don't need permission. 
Informing is about allowing people or supporting people and moving out of the way so that you can stay in that flow without getting interrupted. You model through your own alignment with your own inner creative flow what's possible when we live authentically. And that's the initiation that you bring as an initiator. The, the emotional theme for the initiator is anger. So when you are an initiator and you're moving through and you're following your nonverbal creative flow and somebody stops you and says, hey, what are you doing? Or you're in your flow and something unexpected happens. I don't know if any of you have kids or dogs or cats. Um, my husband calls kids, dogs, and cats random events generators. So if you run into a random event generator while you're moving through with your flow, and now suddenly the dog needs something or a kid needs something, you know, something gets in the way of you following that flow. I know in my house, I, I am not an initiator. I'm a time bender. So I have some of this energy too. And by the way, if any of you are manifesting generators or time benders in quantum human design, you might relate to some of this information too, because some of this information applies to you as well. You know, if, in my house, if there are things in the doorway, shoes, boxes, bags, backpacks, people just drop things in the doorway, it confounds me in my house, right? If there are things in the way or people and I'm in my flow and I'm in the, I'm on my way, right? If something's in my way, I get angry. Now I want to redefine this a little bit because the anger isn't really anger. We call it anger because I don't think we have a good word for it in English. But really what's happening is you're in this flow, right? You're like literally riding this wave of energy as an initiator. You're, you're in this creative process. It's electric. It's fulfillment of quantum pulse, right? And you're doing this thing and all of a sudden you get interrupted. And when you get interrupted, that creative energy, it's like a volcano, right? It has to go somewhere. That energy has to explode because you can't just push it down. It's too powerful inside of you. And so we get angry, but it's not really anger. It's creative disruption. And so when the initiator gets creative disruption going, then they explode, right? The other times that it happens is people will be angry with you as an initiator when you're following that flow and you forgot to inform. That happens all the time, by the way. Informing of all the strategies for type, informing is the most unnatural of all of them. Initiators really have a hard time with informing. And if you're an initiator and you have a hard time informing, you forget sometimes, be nice to yourself. It's not natural. But if you don't understand the importance of informing, you don't realize that sometimes informing saves you more time on the front end than it does cleaning up the mess from the angry person on the other side who you forgot to inform. Here's the example I like to use a lot just to think about. Let's say, for example, you're an initiator type. You are in a relationship with a generator. The two of you decide to watch a movie. Your partner goes into the other room to put on her sweatpants. You go into the kitchen to make popcorn and you realize, oh my God, we're out of popcorn. And so you get in the car and you drive to the store to get popcorn. And of course, in that time, your partner comes out of the bedroom in her, in her sweatpants. She comes into the uh, living room and you're gone. Oh, and you forgot your cell phone. So no way for her to call you to see where you're at. You're in the grocery store. You're running to get the popcorn. You remember, oh, she really likes this wine. You grab a bottle of wine. You check out. You go home ready to hang out with your love for the evening. And you open the door and she is mad. Where have you been? Where did you go? Why didn't you tell me where you went? What do you, why did you just, how can you just leave like that, right? And now all this joyful excitement that you had about bringing popcorn her, and a good, nice glass of wine home for your love is gone. And now she's mad at you and the evening is disrupted. Anger is the symptom of that creative disruption. And again, we experience it internally and externally. One of the things that's important to pay attention to, if we think about this as a signal, if you are an initiator or a time bender, but if you are an initiator and you have a lot of anger in your life, either you're mad yourself, you're angry yourself, or the people around you seem to be always angry with you, that is an important signal for you to stop and assess. Is your creative process being supported? Are you in an environment where you can be supported in following through and following your own creative flow? Are there a lot of interruptions? 
Are people being informed so that they understand what you're doing and who you are? Is there anything going on in your life where your creative dis- where, where creative disruption has become such a problem that now there's anger everywhere you go? Really important signal to pay attention to because if you're in an environment where there's a lot of a lot of anger happening, first of all, it's not healthy. It's hard. It's hurtful. Just because you're a manifester doesn't mean you don't have emotions and feelings and that you don't want to be loved and accepted. And I think sometimes when we talk about manifestors, we think of like bulls in China shops. Uh Uh-uh. You're you're a human being with a heart and you want to be loved and you want to belong. And if you're in an environment where everybody's angry with you all the time and you don't understand that they don't understand you and your creative flow and, and you don't understand how to inform that dynamic can sometimes become really unhealthy for the manifester and cause them to go underground. You don't want to go underground with that power that is you. That's essential for you to be able to do what you came here to do and be who you came here to be. The next type we're going to be talking about is called the alchemist. Alchemists or generators in traditional human design have a deep need to do meaningful work in the world. If you're an alchemist, Your work has to be relevant to you. It has to have some kind of meaning. That doesn't always mean that the work that you do is going to bring the money in, right? We there's an there's a you know somewhere along the way we started saying do what you love and the money will follow. Well, that can be true for the alchemist for sure, but sometimes part of the purpose of the meaning of work for an alchemist is to support your family, take care of your loved ones or create the resources, the money to do this other project on the side that maybe you love that maybe is never gonna be a profitable passion. Maybe you have a passion about, you know, giving eyeglasses to children who don't have eyeglasses, or maybe you have a passion for starting a, a school in Africa. And if that's your passion, maybe the work that you do helps you fund that passion. There has to be a connection though between work and meaning in your life. And that's essential for the alchemist to be able to activate the full potential of your type, of your energy, and to stay in a state of well-being and expansion. You are here to take your cues and clues and signals from the outer world. So in the beginning of your process of remembering how your sacral works, how that inner, deep, resonant, Uh, center that is associated with getting clarity about who you are, what you want, where you should be going, that gut level response that is the sacral response of the alchemist, that sacral response has to feel good and right. Ultimately, part of what you're here to do is to build the infrastructure, literally do the work necessary to build a better world. You are, you know, the builders of the world. You are here to do the work of building the world. And that work has to be, as I said, meaningful and doing that work and responding to everything associated with that work has to feel good and right. Now, the alchemist has an interesting challenge because the alchemist really, in the highest expression, is not just a worker. That's one aspect of the alchemist. But really, the alchemist is here to learn how to learn. You become an expert at life, at being here on the material plane as an alchemist through the process of learning and ultimately learning how to learn. If you don't know how to learn as an alchemist, you run the potential of getting stuck in the shadow side of the emotional theme for the alchemist. And that emotional theme is frustration. If you are an alchemist or you're a generator, you might find that you feel frustrated a lot. Now, you're not going to not feel frustrated, okay? It's going to always happen. It's an essential part of how you learn. But if you don't understand how to work with the frustration, and many of you might relate to this if you're an alchemist type, you may have found that you've been stuck in cycles of starting and quitting and starting and quitting and starting and quitting and starting and quitting and starting and quitting quitting almost all of your life. What's essential to understand if you're an alchemist is your natural learning style and how you learn how to learn and how you ultimately, through that process of learning how you learn, become an expert at being a human, an expert at really working the earth plane and building all these amazing things on this planet. As an alchemist, you have a stair-step learning curve. That means anytime you start something new, 
you have an initial surge in mastery. You're going to start something new. And in the beginning, you're going to very quickly move up to the next level, right? You'll learn something, you'll move up to the next level. So if you learn to play tennis, you know, the first couple of times you have lessons, you learn to do stuff really well. You've got the grip on the rack. I should not talk about tennis. I literally don't know anything about tennis, but hypothetically, you learn how to hold the racket. You learn how to hit the ball. You know, maybe you learn how to serve and you learn how to return the ball, right? But at a certain point, you get stuck, right? It doesn't matter how much you practice. doesn't matter how many lessons you go to. You hit this point where you're like, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. I'm not making progress. It's really interesting to note that when we look at um, when we look at uh, exercise and we look at training for fitness or training for athletes, that plateaus that that it's a natural thing to hit a plateau in the process. So you know the process of learning or training to be an uh, an athlete oftentimes is an alchemist process, right? Plateaus are normal, and oftentimes when we hit plateaus, we have to do two things. We have to either rest. This is if you're an athlete, right? You have to either rest or you have to shake things up. You have to change your strategy a little bit. It's very interesting to know how many athletes, I've talked to so many athletes who after having like a bout of flu or an illness, they'll rest and all of a sudden they come back and now they've broken a world record, right? Because when we hit those plateaus, we have to stop and pay attention because those plateaus are telling us very important information as alchemists. When we hit those plateaus where it feels like I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and nothing's happening, I'm stuck. When we hit those plateaus as alchemists, those plateaus generate the experience of frustration. And our first tendency is to quit and go try something new, right? Quit and go try something new and start over, hit a plateau, quit, go start something new, start over, get a surge of mastery, hit a plateau, quit. Some of you may identify with that. Plateaus are part of the generator process. A plateau means one of two things. It means you're either on the cusp of a breakthrough or it's time for you to quit. But if you don't know how to tell the difference and you just get into the cycle of quitting all the time, you're missing the breakthrough. Because what will happen is if it's your plateau to sit on because you're doing something that's yours to learn, when you sit on that plateau and you start to feel frustrated and stuck, if you wait because you need to wait, that frustration is actually a symptom of momentum building. And as you sit on that plateau, uh, plateau and you feel that momentum building, you have to wait for the breakthrough because what's going to happen is you're going to have another breakthrough and another surge in mastery until you hit another plateau. And then if you know how to sit on that one, you'll sit there until you have another surge in mastery and a breakthrough, right? And then you'll hit another plateau. But if you keep jumping off before you get to go up, up and across on these different levels of learning, these ascension curves that have plateaus on it, you'll never get to experience what it means to become an expert. There really is no uh, one night uh, overnight success for an alchemist. <laughs> the alchemist mastery comes over time and it comes by, comes from learning how to sit on those plateaus of frustration and assess. And the assessment on a plateau is this, is it time for me to quit? And if it is time for you to quit, you have to quit correctly according to your type, meaning you have to have something to respond to, to quit. Meaning somebody has to give you another opportunity or somebody has to ask you, are you frustrated? Do you need to quit? You need to respond. That's the strategy for the alchemist. You need to respond to quit. And if you don't respond to quitting, if you just get up and you're like, I'm done, I quit, and you don't respond to quitting, you're probably going to be stuck in that cycle again and again and again until you learn how, when you learn and remember that when you sit on that plateau, if you're going to quit, you have to respond to quitting. And if nothing's showing up for you to respond to, stick with it. Stick with it until something shows up for you to respond to for quitting or stick with it long enough to see what the next level brings. Where's the breakthrough? And if we can start practicing learning how to interpret frustration as being on the edge of a breakthrough, experiencing inner momentum that your energy is building, and to sit in that frustration with curiosity, and maybe even play and rest and nurture yourself while you're on that plateau instead of getting all frustrated and starting over, 
it would be amazing to see how what many of us might continue to build and expand upon, how our expertise and our wisdom would grow if we learned how to really be present to those plateaus. So recognize that when that frustration kicks up, it's a really good signal. I always tell my clients, they hate me when I say this. And when they say, I'm really frustrated, I feel stuck. I'm like, that's so great because you're about to have a breakthrough of some kind. But they don't want to hear that, right? <laughs> so, but it is, it's a really good sign. And if you can start to really sit in that space and say, okay, do I need to rest? Is there something in the way I'm doing things that needs to shift to create different results? Do I need to wait and be patient and trust that the breakthrough is on its way? Or is there something happening in my life that's showing me the next path, the next opportunity, the next doorway that's opening? And do I need to quit where I am right now so that I can go through that door instead? But if you're just quitting because you're frustrated, you're probably stuck in a cycle, but you might want to break through because that cycle, when we get to the other side of it, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So time benders, time benders are hybrid type. Time benders are part alchemist, part initiator or part uh, generator, part, uh, 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 part manifester. So the time bender has built into them that internal nonverbal creative flow, just like the initiator type. And they also have that responding quality, that defined sacral, that red square on your chart that says they're here to do meaningful work. They're here to respond to life. They're here to become experts and builders. But the challenge for the, man for the manifesting generator is a little bit different because not only do they have both of these elements inside of them, that combination of these two elements makes them a little bit of a different type in and of themselves. So the manifesting generator is here to discover the most efficient way to build a better world. And to do that, the most efficient way oftentimes is in skipping steps. You know, a manifesting generator is designed to skip steps. You will skip steps as a manifesting generator that will be amazing to skip because you'll be like, didn't you do that. Sometimes you will skip steps that you absolutely have to go back and fix. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how careful you are. I'm telling you all this, so you can all forgive yourselves right now. It does not matter how careful you are. If you are a manifesting generator, no matter how deeply dialed into the details you are, you will skip steps. And it's not personal. It's just part of your nature is to do things fast and skip steps. Sometimes you have to respond to going back and fixing those steps. If they were important, sometimes not. Many manifesting generators are multitaskers. You have a lot of energy. You have an, a, a, a sacral defined, which means you have an ongoing, sustainable, 24 seven, get stuff done kind of energy. And you have energy that gets up to the throat center, which means you have this, that nonverbal, not, that internal nonverbal creative flow. And you have to move that energy to stay healthy. If you don't move that energy, if you're a manifesting generator and you're having a hard time sleeping, it might mean you're not moving your energy enough. You have to move that energy through doing. And so oftentimes we find many manifesting generators are multitasking. They're doing many things at once and not everything that they do works out. And oftentimes what we'll see is people who are manifesting generators get judged for that. Oh, well, you just need to pick one thing and focus on it. You're too scattered. You've got, you know, you've got your, your seeds are sown in every field. You're throwing way too much spaghetti to the wall. That is not normal for a manifesting generator. A manifesting generator has to have many things going at once because some of the things that they're doing are there to help them burn energy. Some of the things that they're doing are things that they need to learn so that they can be better at doing something else later. So if you are a manifesting generator and you are multitasking and some people have told you, oh, you just need to slow down and just pick one thing, what they're really saying to you is don't be yourself. You are not designed to go slow and you are not designed to do one thing at a time. In most cases, there are some individual exceptions. Give yourself permission to do it all because you need to. That's how you work. That's how you burn off extra energy. And that's how you experiment and explore and discover your capability. Just like the generator, your work needs to be meaningful. 
So whatever it is that you do, it needs to be tied to some kind of meaning in your personal life, whether it's working to support your family or working towards something that you enjoy, that brings you joy, that's fulfilling, something that supports your passion. Just like the alchemist, you have that sacral intuitive gut level response. And of course, just like um, the, 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 the alchemist, you also take your cues and clues and signals when the timing is right from the world around you. But when you respond, you respond oftentimes with that direct nonverbal flow. So the, the process we see oftentimes for the time bender is that you respond to something, you respond very quickly, you respond, and as soon as you respond, you're moving through the doorways and you're not telling people what you're doing and you're following that flow. And then people are either angry with you or you're angry with them or you're frustrated. And sometimes a combination of anger and frustration, which is, I don't know what we should, we should call that franger. You feel frangry, <laughs> you're frustrated and angry. You have hangry, right? I guess frangry would be something different. Um, so oftentimes the manifesting generator feels both of these emotional themes, the frustration of the alchemist, the anger of the initiator at the same time, and it can be really intense. So just like with the generator types, because a time bender is a generator type or a manifesting generator is a, time, uh, is a generator type, you will have plateaus where you feel stuck. And those plateaus will feel, you'll feel not only frustrated, oftentimes you can even feel angry. And sometimes what happens when the manifesting generator sits on a plateau is they're already starting other stuff on the side because they're like starting to build the contingency plan because all that energy starts building up. And so they're like, well, maybe I'll do this and that and this and that and this. And it can be very frenetic. And then people are angry or frustrated with you because you're occupying this very frenetic place and you're not present, and sometimes you're distracted or you're overcommitted because you're trying to figure out what's next, what's next, and figure out the good strategy for quitting and quitting well. Just like the alchemist, if you are a time mentor, you need to learn to be with the frustration and manage it. And sometimes that means walking, moving, getting the body moving, because that can help. And sometimes it means learning how to either rest, God forbid, time benders, rest, or think about, is there something in the way I'm doing it that needs to shift or change so that I'm ready for the breakthrough? It's also important to understand that when you're following that nonverbal creative flow, that, that initiator, that, that manifesting energy, that just like with a manifestor or an initiator, you're also informing. And if there's a situation in your life, again, where you either have chronic anger issues or chronic frustration issues, you really need to take stock of your environment and make sure that you're being supported and that you're learning to be with the frustration long enough to interpret whether it's a signal to wait because you're on the cusp of a breakthrough or it's a signal that it's time to change course, change tactics. The orchestrators or our projectors, projectors have a natural ability to see the potential of the world. This is the gift of an orchestrator. I've had the privilege of raising an orchestrator from birth. She's 14 now. And I will tell you as a mother of a projector that your projectors, your orchestrators really know things. <laughs> they can naturally see the potential of something and not just see the potential of something, they know exactly how to guide people towards fulfilling that potential. And it is as natural to them as, as it is to a sheepdog herding sheep. They know this, it's part of their nature, it's innate, they're born with it. They don't have to cultivate it. I've, I've told this story often, many of you maybe have heard the story of, you know, when my daughter was little, and when we would be riding around in the car, I would literally have to lock the windows on the car so she couldn't roll them down because she would roll down her window and yell corrections at people. She would yell at people for not wearing their helmet. She would yell at people for smoking because smoking is bad for you. She would yell corrections everywhere. And I thought, oh my gosh, at some point she's gonna roll down her window and yell at somebody and they're gonna get really mad at us. So I'd roll the windows up and lock it so she couldn't project, project or manage people from the car even as a teeny tiny tot. Our projectors are profoundly intuitive and sensitive. When we talk about the quantum human design expression of the projector energy, it's the orchestrator who is 
holding the vision of the future of the world and they're tending energetically to that vision and facilitating and nurturing and energetically making sure that that vision comes to fruition. They're dialed into the the template of the future and the template of the health and the well-being of the planet and they're managing it. They're managing it energetically, even if they're laying on the couch. So this is a really big job you have if you are a projector or an orchestrator. And you are really literally here to midwife through the management, through the wisdom that you bring midwife the world into fulfilling its potential. So the beauty about this is it's incredibly powerful. It's such an amazing thing to watch when it's healthy and in place shadow side of this energy is that if you're not waiting for people who are ready for the for the for the for the transformation that you bring if you have all these insights if you have all this knowledge if you have all this wisdom about the potential and you're not waiting for the right people to ask you for it if you're not serving the right people because you you haven't learned the importance of waiting for recognition and attention which is the uh, strategy for the orchestrator, if you haven't learned the value of what you bring and you waste your precious energy because energy is of a premium to the orchestrators, if you waste your precious energy trying to manage, guide, and direct people who aren't ready for what you have to say, you will burn out. You will waste your gift and you will end up depleted and exhausted. The emotional theme for the orchestrator is really important to pay attention to. And I think of all the emotional themes, one of the more misunderstood and challenging emotional themes. The emotional theme for the orchestrator, this beautiful person who's here to manage and guide us towards the fulfillment of our potential, the right people who are ready to hear them. That's, you know, when these beautiful people are not following their strategy, they get bitter. Bitterness is a repelling energy. So any of you who have experienced the bitterness of a projector, for example, or who feel bitter because you have a projector in your life that's not meeting your definition of success or your definition of how they should be behaving, you have, you're trying to push the cultural narrative or cultural expectations onto a projector and you're assuming that they should be out working and having a real job and doing all that stuff that we tell projectors to do, you can feel bitter with them if they're not bringing in the money or they're tired, right? Bitterness is repelling. And that's such a really cool thing, even though it doesn't feel cool when you're in it. Because when you are repelling people because you're bitter, they're not asking you for an invitation. And so even though it's hard to process this, bitterness is extremely protective. Bitterness pushes people away because when you are bitter, you're exhausted. When you feel bitter, you need to heal oftentimes your, your own sense of self-worth. When you feel bitter, you need rest. And if you were available energetically for people to come find you and call you out and give you invitations, but you needed to rest or you needed to heal and you didn't understand that about yourself, you might push through that exhaustion and keep going until you really hit that exhaustion. Bitterness is repelling because you're not available for an invitation. Bitterness is repelling because the cosmos and the universe and its infinite wisdom says, this person isn't available right now because they need rest or they need to heal. And so when we have bitterness as a theme, if you're an orchestrator with bitterness as a theme, it's really important if you feel bitter, when you catch that bitterness and you hear yourself saying, that's not fair, to stop and say, hmm, something my being is exhausted. Something my being maybe needs healing. Maybe I'm not valuing myself enough to allow myself to rest. Maybe I'm not valuing myself enough to do my life the way that's a light right and aligned for me and my gifts that I bring. Maybe I need to rest and heal. Or because one of the shadow elements of the orchestrator is that sometimes the orchestrator can't see themselves. They're really, really good at seeing everybody else, but they don't always see themselves. 
Sometimes you need people in your life who love you, my dear orchestrators, who hear and feel and sense your bitterness to turn around and say to you, hey, you seem tired. You seem depleted. You seem burned out. I think you might need some rest. How can we facilitate that for you? When we take care of our orchestrators, they take really good care of us. They give us deep wisdom and insights and information that we need to really maximize our potential. But oftentimes they need extra support to stay nourished, recharged, regenerated, and healed because they don't operate. They don't work energetically the way the other types do. They don't have the same quality of energy. And that's not a moral flaw. That's not a character problem. That's not a problem in general. And if we can start reframing our narrative around the projector so that we start to recognize that, that rest and renewal and, and restoration and healing keep our projectors operating at a high level, we'll all benefit from that. We'll all benefit from that. Last, but definitely not least, our calibrators or our reflectors. Reflectors are here to mirror back the energy that they are experiencing. The way that they demonstrate and live and express in the world is literally a mirror that helps us gauge how close or how far are we from fulfilling our potential. So they are, to a certain degree, the barometer for the quality of well-being in the world around them. Now, I'm going to share with you, that's the lower expression of the reflector. In the higher expression, when we call them calibrators, in that higher expression, the calibrator learns how to be at home within themselves. They learn how to really sense and feel and know their own self within the experience that they're having. They also can see the potential, much like a, an orchestrator. The difference is the orchestrator knows how to guide people to fulfilling it. The calibrator just sees it. The calibrator has built into them this deep, visceral understanding of the potential of the human story. And when they live from that place, as they mature and they start to understand the way their energy works and they're better able to regulate their inner sense of at-homeness and who they are, then they don't fall prey to some of the shadow elements of their reflector energy. They, they, don't, they, they don't get enmeshed in other people's energies. They don't fall in love with people's potentials in the same way. But to do that, they have to learn about themselves and it, that takes time as it does for all of us. They learn about themselves and how they experience themselves in and outside of different communities and different environments. The, the calibrator, as part of their strategy, they need a lot of time, oftentimes a minimum of a full cycle of the moon, sometimes more, they need a lot of time and often oral processing, I mean, they need to talk in order to tease out their own direction and their own path, their own decisions in the sea of the energy that they are experiencing. Because they need a lot of time, oftentimes they feel a lot of pressure in our fast moving society to make decisions quickly. And if they fall prey to that pressure, if they don't have the ability to take that time that they need, then they often experience the emotional theme of disappointment. So I've shared with you all that my oldest daughter, my oldest stepdaughter is a reflector and she is an actor. And, you know, in her profession, she's in her young thirties, in her profession, if she goes for an audition and she gets a call back, she can't wait out the whole cycle of the moon to let them know, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, right? She has to make a decision in the moment to go jump into this, this show or this play or whatever she's doing. And there have been many times when she's been deeply disappointed because it wasn't what she thought it would be, but she didn't have the luxury of being able to take the time she needed as a reflector to really feel her way through the decision. The emotional theme of disappointment comes from two different places for the calibrator. The first place that it comes from, it comes from not having enough time to make important decisions. Okay, so then that when you're a calibrator and you can't make the, the, the right decision, I mean, sorry, you don't have the time to make the right decision and you're pressured to make a quick decision, then sometimes you make that decision and then you're kind of stuck with it and you can't get out of it because it ends up being the wrong place or the wrong environment. 
There's a second theme to the disappointment of the calibrator. Remember the calibrator has nine open centers. So anywhere where we have openness, if you look at your own center, anywhere where we have openness is where we take energy and information in. And ultimately the purpose of openness is to be wise. So when we are wise about others in our openness, we are better able to really see the potential and so the calibrator with all of that openness has an enormous potential, a very unique potential to really be wise about the entire human story. And the shadow of that wisdom is that the, the calibrator really knows the full potential of humanity and can sometimes be deeply disappointed in how we're actually living out our potential. So this is why oftentimes we'll see calibrators drawn to things like orphanages and working in, in softer, sweeter spaces, because sometimes when they're working with children, they're not as disappointed in the children as they are in us as adults. So I wanna just bring us back to the mechanics of heart resonance and remind you that your emotional theme is not about your creative energy unless you make it about your creative energy. If you start defining that emotional theme in such a way that you're using the I am phrase, I am angry, I am frustrated, I am angry and frustrated, I am disappointed, I am bitter. When we start adding those phrases to our personal narrative and identifying with them, we incorporate them into our identity and that identity is part of our G center. That's what's setting the tone and the direction for our life. So if you walk away today with, a, with just a couple of things, here's some things I want you to walk away with. Number one, I want you to walk away with the awareness that your emotional theme is telling you something. And if you're experiencing your emotional theme right now in a big way, what is it telling you? What is it telling you? And are, are there changes that you need to make in order to bring yourself back into harmony with a better story about who you are? The second thing that I wanna just remind you and encourage you is that the more we live true to our type, the more we understand what triggers that emotional theme, not being able to follow your internal nonverbal creative flow for the initiator, not knowing how to deal with the frustration of a plateau for the alchemist, not being able to sit on that plateau as a time bender and also follow that internal nonverbal creative flow, not being, not having the energy available for invitations, or maybe having devalued yourself and putting yourself and in accept into situations where you've accepted invitations that were not right for you as a, as an orchestrator, or not taking the time you need as a calibrator to make the right decision, and not ma and making sure that as a calibrator you haven't fallen in love with people's potential, that you're really looking at who they are and what they're doing, and making sure that in your relationships, the people you love are living their potential or at least actively working towards it and that you're not disappointed in who you're surrounding yourself with. When you can read those signals well, you can move yourself towards a more authentic expression of yourself. This, the key to understanding what these signals are telling you and, and when you understand what these signals are telling you, it improves your health. It improves your health dramatically. I have research to back that up. It improves your financial relationship, your relationship with your professions. It allows you to fulfill your life purpose in the juiciest, most powerful way. And it makes your relationships better because all of a sudden it's not personal. People aren't doing these things to make you angry, bitter, frustrated, disappointed. It's what's happening in your environment and it's a signal. Your life becomes more aligned. It becomes more meaningful, becomes richer and more authentic. And the key to doing that is living true to yourself, knowing yourself well enough, understanding yourself well enough to be able to really interpret all the cues, the clues, the signals, the energies, the in, inner world, the outer world, what you're seeing, so that you can really be in this cosmic dance between you and your exterior manifestations so that you can keep creating in bigger, more expansive ways. Human design can be an incredibly complex tool, but it also can be a tool. I mean, I don't even want to call it a tool. I realize that a crowbar is a tool or a fulcrum is a tool, but it really is a fulcrum or, or a crowbar. It's this, this lever that we can use to, to catapult us into big steps where we fully activate the full potential of who we are. But to do that, you have to understand the nuances in the chart. You have to understand all the stories in the chart. You really have to understand what exactly does the chart mean to you. And sometimes learning about it, like either from a book 
or taking a master class, all oh, this is kind of fun because we're ta- at least I'm talking. I hope you guys get a chance to talk. You know, then being in an environment where you feel supported, where you get access to information that specifically addresses the concerns in your life, your specific concerns, like how does human design affect money and our money relationship? How do we manifest with human design? Where's intuition in the chart? How do we have better relationships with human design? How does human design affect my business, my work? We have to learn human design in the context of our real everyday life. And there's actually not a lot of information out there about how to do that. Over the years, I've watched people really grapple and and play with and learn and expand and grow from their human design. But I've also seen people really struggle with it to not really be able to take this brilliant tool and leverage it for the for the brilliant the the brilliant lever that it is. So I created a, a membership community, the Understanding Human Design membership community, as a way of having a portal for people to come and really get nitty gritty practical about how do you actually live your design. Over the years, I've taught all kinds of really powerful general courses. I've taught courses about relationships, about money about your body, just taught one about your body recently um, and how to activate wellness. I've taught courses about intuition, about, we even talked about angels in human design. I have so much information from working about with human design and working with clients over the last 20, 20, almost 24 years that I really wanna share with you in an environment that allows you to let your guard down, to be vulnerable, to be supported, to get your questions answered, by me or by my team so that you can really use this tool as a tool to disrupt your current life, as a tool to disrupt your current story if it's not serving you, to disrupt any ways of thinking that you might have that might be keeping you back from really fulfilling your potential. The other challenge that I've always had with human design is that you know, in the human design community as a whole, and even from the very beginning, human design has always been Um, somewhat of an exclusive program. It's been a program that in some ways has been cost prohibitive, especially if you don't want to learn to do it professionally. There's really not a whole other, a lot of other ways to learn about human design where you get support and you get to ask your questions and you get to be in community. And, you know, I really wanted to make sure, especially at this time on the planet, because we all need this information. So, so it's just such an imperative that we know this about ourselves at this time. I really wanted to create a space where people could come and come at an affordable cost and come and really talk about their chart or their kids' charts or what's going on in their charts. So I, as I said, I created this Understanding Human Design membership as this portal for people to have the opportunity to really drop into learning how to live your design. So in the Understanding Human Design community, the very foundation of the community, we, we go through this process that we call the expedition. So we have an exclusive 90-day curriculum called the expedition curriculum. And in the expedition curriculum, we walk through in great depth in course materials that walk you through understanding your type, understanding your strategy, understanding your authority, how to live it. What does it look like? We actually have meetings, live meetings, where you can come and talk about, hey, I've got this going on. What does this mean for my design? What's my, my chart? This is my chart. What do you see in my chart about that? So we have this extensive curriculum that we go through over the course of 90 days, culminating in a two-hour intensive with me, where you get to really deep dive and talk about your chart. You get a, a private community, a private community that, oh my gosh, our community is so sweet. They love each other so much. They're they're all like thumb up, thumb upping. Is that a verb? Thumb upping, thumb upping each other in chat. They're connecting. They're we have private online community where you can connect and be with other people who speak human design. Uh, we've got people sharing their own experiences, their own journey with their story, their own journey with their chart. It's just a really beautiful place to come and build connection and build a deeper connection, not only with others, but with yourself and your chart and the true story of who you are. In addition to that, in the community, once a week, I publish usually about a 10 minute video about the energy for the week. So you get a forecast for the week that walks you through uh, what's what's up in the celestial weather. How is it impacting you? What can you expect? What, what gates get highlighted this week? 
once a year, I put out a, a guide for this, the celestial weather for the year. This is the quantum human design 2023 guide. As a member of the understanding human design community, you get an, uh, an ebook version of this guide every year, in addition to weekly energy forecasts that help you. And those energy forecasts, by the way, they come with contemplations, questions. The, the contemplations and the questions and the overview that you get every week really help you know how to navigate whatever's up in the celestial weather. So for example, right now, everything's retrograde. And so if you're feeling like two steps forward, one step back, that's a really normal thing to be feeling right now. We're kind of stuck in the cosmic goo. So if you were in the membership, I would be giving you, you got insights this week about how do you get out of the cosmic goo? The other part of the membership that we do is we've got live weekly meetups. We have special events. We have creative activities. Um, Teresa actually leads people through all kinds of creative activities and, and fun events. I'm in there almost every week. We have, as we said, live intensives where you get to explore material. We also have ongoing topics and conversations that are specific to what's going on in your life. So we just actually finished up a whole series of calls about money. And ne our next topic, we're gonna talk about how do the transits impact your chart? And we're gonna talk about how do you look at the transit report or an ephemeris? And, and how do you interpret how that affects your chart so that you can always know like what's up in the celestial weather and how does that affect me? We're also gonna take a big overview for what's up in the celestial weather for the next couple of years, because we're in a very interesting time in terms of the celestial weather. Um, we're also going to be putting some more programming in there for you to watch privately. So any of our old general courses related to money, well-being, relationship, we'll be putting some of our general courses in there as well. So if you've ever taken any of my general courses, you know that my general courses, usually when I sell a general course or I teach a general course, it's usually about a $250 to $297 course. So I just taught a quantum body course at the beginning of the year, which was a course where we went through all the correlations between the bodies and the sound frequency. We, I created custom sound frequencies for each of the centers. Um, and then we walked through how do you generate better mindsets around health and wellness that course was, I think that course when we, if we, if you had got it on sale was a $250 course. Maybe I think it was a little more because it had the sound frequencies in it. And so, you know, you can expect to pay just for one general course about $250 to $300. The membership is actually $350 a year or $35 a month, which is basically what you would pay for one general course. But in the membership, you get access to general courses. You get access to exclusive courses that aren't available anymore. You get weekly live support. You get the weekly energy forecast. You get the 90-day expedition. And it's all in there at a very affordable price that allows you to have access to personal support. It's kind of like getting a reading, but not getting a reading. You get to actually come in and talk about your stuff, your chart, your things you get to have that personal support to support you in fulfilling your potential, to support you in looking at, well, what do you need to change in order to bring yourself into greater harmony with the true story of who you are? So I really hope you will join me for this because I can't tell you, it's, it's kind of a no brainer opportunity. And I don't say that, I don't really don't say that um, because I hate it when people say that when they're trying to explain something to you or they're trying to sell something to you. But I actually really believe that, that this is a place where you can go get all your questions answered about human design for, I don't know what coffee costs you guys anymore. We used to, everybody else used to talk about coffee as a reference. So I'll talk about coffee as a reference. Let's just say that it's probably less than what some of us are spending on Amazon. How's that? I'm, I'll just say that that for a very low cost, you're going to get such deep insights that are going to be the, 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 the fulcrum, the lever that's going to catapult you into stepping into the fulfillment of the potential that is you and give you a deep, rich understanding of not only your own chart, but even charts of the people you love so that you can show up for the life you were born to live and be the person you were born to be. Because I want that for you. And let me tell you why I want that for you. You know, I've been reading a book recently written by T.D. Jakes about disruption. And in this book, he's been talking about disruptive thinking. We are at a point in our life where we cannot continue living the same story today as we speak. 
whether you want to consider, you know, whether you want to talk about global warming, whatever, things are definitely not working. We can, we can, you know, I think we all have different ideas about why they're not working, but they're not working. We can't create peace. We can't create sustainability. We can't create abundance. We can't create the solutions that we need to be generating at this time on the planet if we can't build them within ourselves first. There is so much wisdom in the story of be the change you wish to see in the world. If we wanna change the world, we have to first start at home. We have to first start with ourselves. And this information is designed to help you understand yourself, learn about yourself, bring yourself into alignment with yourself so that you can change whatever's going on inside of you so that you can be in alignment with your own peace your own abundance, your own sustainability, and then in turn, be part of creating that for the world. All right, that's it for me. I wanna thank you all so much for being here and for joining me. I really appreciate all your questions. I look forward to seeing you in the membership. Thank you, Teresa, for managing everything and uh, see you soon. Bye.